Thanks for joining us for KSAT News at 9, streaming from here right in the KSAT newsroom. I'm Steve Spreister. Coming up tonight, Texas Governor Greg Abbott laying out plans to restart the economy. We'll be joined by the president of the San Antonio Food Bank to talk to him about how the food bank is preparing for an increase in need for thousands of local families. Plus, a look at how local organizations and school districts are making sure students stay connected while classrooms are closed. But first, let's take a look at the latest numbers. There are now 959 cases of COVID-19 in Bear County. That is 41 more cases than last night. Here's a look at how they break down. 384 cases were contracted through close contact with a previously infected person. 328 are community transmission. 183 are travel related. 80 people remain hospitalized tonight with 25 on ventilators. For a second day in a row, there are no new deaths to report. The death toll stands at 37. 196 people have recovered. It's been five weeks since the first COVID-19 case was confirmed in Bear County, and here is a look at how those cases have grown in our area. It actually took two weeks for the first case to reach to 120 cases. From there, it only took a few days to get to 229 cases. On April 7th, there were 503 confirmed COVID-19 cases in Bear County, and just last week there were 665. Again, tonight's count, 959 cases. During tonight's city county daily briefing, Mayor Ron Nuremberg confirmed a fifth San Antonio firefighter has tested positive for COVID-19. Nuremberg says the outbreak was from Station 14 on Thousand Oaks near Henderson Pass. At last count, 53 uniformed firefighters are in quarantine. At the Bear County Jail, 15 inmates and 21 deputies and several auxiliary civilian employees have now tested positive for COVID-19. With the increase in cases, the county judge says they want to provide a new mask for inmates every day, but right now that's not possible because they don't have a big enough supply. Tiffany Huertas has a look at the situation. We did provide a mask to every um, inmate. Uh, we've asked them to try to use it for two or three days because we don't have enough supply. As the number of inmates who tested positive for the coronavirus continues to increase, the county judge says they don't have enough masks to give a new one to inmates every day. We've warned them or told them that if it gets moist or soiled, uh, we, need to, we need to replace it for them. So yes, that we, they are using it more than one day. Earlier today, the KSAT defender spoke with people recently released from jail. At least three inmates said they wore their mask for several days, with one woman saying by the time she was released, her mask was literally falling apart. And Dr. Anita Curian, yes, assistant uh, director of San Antonio Metro Health, says the condition of a mask is important. It doesn't matter how many times you change the mask, as long as the mask that you're using is pristine, meaning it's not soiled, not contaminated, uh, and it's not damaged or, or soggy even. Judge Wolf says the inmates who tested positive are in separate cells and away from the rest of the population. We're twice a day, regardless of whether they have uh, symptoms or not. We're taking their temperature and, it, and we're checking to see if they do have symptoms. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar says two large shipments of masks should be arriving soon. Judge Wolf says every day they have a conference call about the situation inside the jail. He says they're putting together a report, tracking the information, and will share that with the community soon. Steve. Thank you, Tiffany. Turning now to cases in our surrounding counties. Hayes and Bandera counties are seeing increases with 121 and four cases, respectively. Guadalupe County reporting 53 cases, Comal 43, and Wilson 19. Statewide, there are now more than 17,000 cases and 428 deaths. Meanwhile, as expected, Governor Greg Abbott announced initial steps today to reopen the Texas economy. Abbott announcing what he's calling a statewide strike force that will oversee a phased reopening. As part of the first phase, state parks will reopen on Monday. Visitors must wear face coverings and follow social distancing guidelines. Then starting on April 22nd, an order that placed restrictions on elective surgeries and some medical procedures will be eased. Then a week from today, all stores across Texas will be able to reopen for pickup, shipping or delivery. Additional openings will be announced on Monday, April 27th after further input from medical experts. Consider the possibility of opening more venues, venues like restaurants, movie theaters and other gathering places that 
can provide safe distancing practices. They will also consider expanding elective surgeries. The governor also announced today that public school classrooms will be closed for in-person learning through the rest of the academic year. With classrooms closed for the remainder of the academic year, teachers will have to continue conducting online learning, but not all students have access to the Internet. Tonight, we look at how local companies and schools are working together to bring Internet to communities who need it the most. Tiffany Huertas shows us how their efforts are impacting families. It'll help a lot because they can actually have their Wi-Fi to do the work during the day. Like students across the world right now, Amanda Garcia says her daughter, who is a first grader at Jackson Keller Elementary, is learning online instead of in a classroom. But since they don't have internet at home, they've been using cell phone service. I know there's a lot of people that don't have, have the Wi-Fi, so it'll help them a lot. This week, VIA announced a collaboration with the City of San Antonio, the San Antonio Housing Authority, San Antonio ISD, and Northside ISD to provide mobile Wi-Fi to students using a VIA van. The vehicles were placed in different locations based on the student population in the area, available resources, and vehicle access. In Garcia's community of Lincoln Heights, you can see several VIA vans parked along the streets. We have been able uh, to develop a schedule so that the children know when they have available Wi-Fi. Residents accessing the network cannot board the vans and they must follow social distancing guidelines. Dr. Anna Margarita Cha Guzman with Saha says there are 20 vehicles placed in communities they manage. Most of the properties in their community rooms already have it, but we want for all of the children so that their parents can help them with their homework in the home. Dr. Guzman says just in public housing properties, there are more than 6,000 children. That is good for now, but it's not good enough. What we want and what we're going to be asking the community is for all of our properties to have Wi-Fi and internet. But they are not the only ones trying to bridge the digital divide. Harlandale ISD is using school buses to bring internet to communities. The district says families can drive to one of the locations, park and download their kids' assignments from their vehicles. I think it's still good that they, that they could still do the work. For the Nine, Tiffany Huertas. The AT&T Center and Bibliotech are also offering a way for students and families to access the Internet for free. Wi-Fi will be available from 8 in the morning until 730 at night daily in lot three of the AT&T Center. All right, let's zoom out now. As of tonight, there are nearly 700,000 cases in the United States of COVID-19 and 31,000 deaths. Globally, there are 2.2 million cases and more than 153,000 deaths. Turning to tonight's 9 at 9, R. Kelly's court date in Brooklyn has been pushed back. Another racehorse has been euthanized at a California track and a roundup of how COVID-19 is impacting communities across the globe. Here's tonight's 9 at 9. Officials in Wuhan, China, revising the city's coronavirus death toll. Within the past few hours, nearly 1,300 new deaths were added, raising the total of more than 3,800. The city also increased the total number of cases to more than 50,000. This comes as the U.S. accuses China of hiding the scope of the epidemic from the world. We now know the identity of a U.S. sailor who died after contracting the coronavirus. The U.S. Navy says Chief Petty Officer Charles Robert Thacker Jr. died from COVID-19. The 41-year-old was being treated at U.S. Naval Hospital Guam. He tested positive for the virus back in March while he was assigned to the USS Theodore Roosevelt. A parishioner of a Louisiana church that's been defying the governor's ban on gatherings of more than 10 people has died of complications from COVID-19. Life Tabernacle Church has held services with hundreds of people over the past month despite the governor's executive order. The pastor arrested on March 31st and charged with six misdemeanor counts of disobeying the powers of government. Another horse was euthanized this week at Santa Anita Park in Southern California bringing the total number of horse deaths there this year to nine. The track says MC Hamster, a four-year-old horse, fractured its left front ankle during training on the main track. The injury was determined to be unrecoverable. Horse deaths at the track gained nationwide attention last year when officials briefly suspended racing after more than 20 racehorses died in 10 weeks. R. Kelly's day in a Brooklyn court is delayed. The singer-songwriter's trial date was scheduled for July. It's now been moved to September. 
Toxic blue-green algae has been spotted along Lake Okeechobee in Florida. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection reports one test taken earlier this month had 36 parts per billion of algae in the sample. Samples are reported toxic when it reaches eight parts per billion. Police in Las Vegas seizing $8.6 million worth of illegal marijuana. They say there were 5,700 plants there, making this the largest indoor marijuana grow operation they've shut down in their area. A group of police officers in Colombia bringing music and joy to this neighborhood as they dance Zumba outside an apartment complex. Residents stood by their windows and balconies and danced along. The officers hope Zumba helps relieve cabin fever for many who've been under self-quarantine for weeks. In Italy, a violinist pays tribute to healthcare workers on the front lines of the battle against COVID-19 by playing a song on her rooftop. To read more about these stories, head to ksat.com. Good evening. I hope you've had a wonderful week. The weather is much different today. Cloudy, even a little bit of light rain here or there. And if you haven't been outside in the past couple of hours, you may not have noticed that it has gotten significantly cooler out there behind a front that moved through late this afternoon, early this evening. That'll set us up for a really fall like day on Saturday, but that will not continue all weekend. Things are going to turn around and change very quickly by Sunday. It'll be feeling a lot more like late spring, early summer for the back half of the upcoming weekend and then that warmth will continue through the duration of next week. So check out your day tomorrow. Things will be staying pretty cool and cloudy. We'll start off low 50s, high temperatures only in the low 60s for your Saturday with a 30% chance of some isolated light rain mainly through early afternoon. And then look at the huge change as we get into Sunday. There will be an early morning window for some showers and non-severe storms, but then we'll clear out sunny in the afternoon and that puts our high temperatures in the upper 80s and low 90s so a 20 to 30 degree temperature swing is coming at you from saturday afternoon to sunday afternoon so just be ready for that as we head into the day tomorrow skies will still be overcast some sprinkles will be possible in the morning and then some slightly heavier isolated showers possible through mid-morning that will continue through the early part of the afternoon we should catch a little bit of a break from that light rain late saturday afternoon into saturday evening Overnight through the pre-dawn hours of Sunday morning, some fog and drizzle will begin to develop. So very early before dawn on Sunday, things will still be pretty gross out there. Uh, but we're going to see a frontal boundary come through and clear us out such that by midday on Sunday, we are under full sunshine. And that's a big reason why we'll warm up and get so unseasonably warm for this time of year by the afternoon hours. You're going to hear a lot about the risk for severe weather this weekend, especially on Sunday. And I do want to put your mind at ease and let you know that the concern for that severe weather Sunday is going to be well to our east in far east Texas and then across portions of the southeast. The storms early on Sunday when they're in our area, they're going to be on the weaker side. And I don't even think we'll hear a rumble of thunder here in San Antonio. It'll all be north and east of us. So no concerns for severe weather as we head into this weekend. So we get up to 90 Sunday afternoon. A few more clouds will bring us back down to the upper 80s by Monday, Tuesday, and especially into Wednesday, we'll have chances of isolated showers and thunderstorms, but things will be staying warm with afternoon high temperatures in the upper 80s and low 90s through the end of next week. We'll be right back. Back here at home beginning on Monday, wearing a face mask in public will be mandatory. That's thanks to an amended emergency declaration issued yesterday by the city of San Antonio in Bear County. The new orders have received some mixed reaction and they have some people asking questions. 
Hey, if it, if it means staying alive, hey, I, I wear the mask and the gloves. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I don't know if logistically <laughs> it's possible to, um, you know, really make sure everyone's doing it. I guess the hope would be that by mandating it, more people would have the integrity to kind of follow it. They're taking our freedom in the name of public safety. So if we were to do this interview on the 20th, and it's in place, I'm not wearing a mask right now. Are, are the police going to, to roll up inside me? Yes, they are. According to the order, they could and fine you $1,000 or order you to spend six months in jail. There are some exceptions to the new rules, including if you're exercising, eating or drinking and while in a building that requires surveillance like a bank. It turning to tonight's top stories, the pandemic has put a stop to a lot of things we're familiar with, but it hasn't stopped the need for blood donations. An O blood type is especially in high demand. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center is now taking appointments and holding blood drives in remote locations to abide by social distancing guidelines. One was held today at Holmes High School, but there was a big problem here. Here today at this blood drive at Holmes High School, we're seeing about a 51% show rate, which is about half of, of the donors who said they were going to come out. Details on how and where to donate blood can be found at KSAT.com. Meanwhile, San Antonio home sales were actually up in March by 4% over last year. Realtors tell us they are seeing a bit of a slowdown, but they're still doing business just differently. They're relying on virtual open houses and video tours a lot more. For in-person showing, realtors say they are following specific health guidelines. There's been a lot of misinformation when it comes to the coronavirus, and you can't trust everything you see online. That's why the Associated Press has been fact-checking some of the most popular but completely untrue claims surrounding the pandemic for the past several weeks. Let's take a look. Our first claim of the night, you can simply call a 1-800 number, enter your social security number to check on the status of the relief check that the federal government is sending as part of the economic recovery bill. This is a hoax. There's a way you can check on the status of your check. However, you can just go to irs.gov, scroll down, click on the economic impact payments section. All right, the next claim we're fact checking tonight, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer has banned hydrochloroquine for use against COVID-19. Social media posts imply that the Democratic governor banned the anti-malaria drug because President Donald Trump began pushing for its use against the coronavirus. This is not true, however. Michigan's Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs did, however, release a memo in March asking for physicians and pharmacists not to stockpile the drug and create a shortage for the patients who actually rely on it. The last claim we're fact checking tonight, meat processing company Smithfield Foods recently sold to China. Online posts go on to say that hogs will be raised in the U.S. but slaughtered and packaged for sale in China before being sent back to the United States. Social media users are saying this is due to the hundreds of employees testing positive for the coronavirus at a processing plant in the U.S. in South Dakota, as a matter of fact. Here are the facts. A spokesperson for Smithfield Foods confirmed to the Associated Press that all of the company's U.S. products are made in one of their nearly 50 facilities across America. Coronavirus Q&A. These images are actually captured during the Food Bank's mega distribution event last week. It shocked people across the city and the country. They served as a reminder of the economic toll the pandemic is having on people in our community. And during tonight's Coronavirus Q&A, we're joined by Eric Cooper, the president and CEO of the San Antonio Food Bank. I, I really appreciate you being here because I know you did a mega distribution this morning. Are you struck by how many people you are seeing that have not needed your services before? Yeah, Steve. I mean, we're we're amazed, I think, at the unprecedented demand that has just come our way. Uh, San Antonio has been a city that struggled for a long time. We've got a high rate of poverty. We've got a lot of working poor families that were living on the edge. And uh, the coronavirus, in a lot of ways, has pushed them over the edge. But there's so many families that have never had to ask for help. So many families that were donors of the food bank or volunteers of the food bank. Their companies came out and served. And now those are the people that we are serving. Today, 2,000 families at the Alamo Dome 
70% of them, uh, this was the first time they've ever had to ask for help. And so uh, it is our privilege uh, to serve, and San Antonio has really rallied and enabled us to make sure people are getting food. Those are amazing numbers. And I think you told us earlier, so you, like you were serving 60,000 meals a week, and now you're up to 120,000, is that correct? Yeah, so typically that was our, our, our head count. So we would serve about 60,000 people a week um, over our 16 counties. Um, and now that number today is 120,000 people a week getting food from the food bank and our partner pantries. Now we have about 500 partner pantries. These are churches or traditional nonprofits that the food bank uh, serves and they all withdraw from the main warehouse. And then in addition to that, we've always supplemented distributions with these pop-up uh, uh, distributions. And, and usually these pop-up distributions, they'd serve two to 400 families. Uh, at the onset of the COVID crisis, uh, they, they went from a couple of hundred families to a couple of thousand families. And um, we went to this uh, mega distribution strategy, number one, to make sure we were keeping our volunteers safe. Um, it's so critical to be physically distanced and just be prepared to, to, to manage the crowds. Um, and they are the heroes. Our volunteers uh, that we're serving today and have been serving, they're choosing to come onto the front lines and put themselves in some ways at risk, right? I think uh, we're doing everything safe, but they're still stepping out onto the front line and, and helping families in this time of crisis. So yeah. I couldn't be any more proud of them. Let's get to some of the questions that our viewers uh, actually sent to us on our website. The first one is, what did you learn during last week's mega distribution event and what changes were made before the event that you had this morning? Well, I think number one, we're really trying to get the word out about what other assistance is available for families. And the food bank's known for helping families apply for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP. And we want viewers to know about that program, again, with 70% of our uh, families coming to us for the first time, they don't know about the resources. And so we've been educating them about SNAP and the opportunity for them to get food through that federal safety net. Um, you know, I, I don't like the fact that we're giving out food in a parking lot. I think people should get food in a grocery store. Uh, obviously, uh, a meaningful job and wage allows someone to shop at a grocery store, but also the supplemental nutrition assistance program. So number one, it's been just educating people about those resources that decreases our demand at sites like happened last week. And then this decentralized approach, we really connect families to their closest food pantries um, throughout our 16 counties. And then we set up lots of of more pop-up strategies. We had um, pop-up distributions happening all over the city at a smaller scale, really targeting specific neighborhoods, specific areas where we could serve family to take demand off of the mega site um, so that we wouldn't get the 10,000 that we got last week. Yeah, the, the next question is there was another mega distribution event today. In your opinion, how did that go? It went really smooth. I mean, it, it breaks my heart that we're not able to serve every family. And I know um, when we got started, there were families that had not registered um, that we told, hey, um, you need to register for this event. If you need food, here's the locations that we can get you food quickly, but it, it won't be at this event. We, we brought enough food to make sure we took care of all those that had registered and, uh, you know, it, it, it does, it breaks my heart to have to um, use that tough love, but we wanna make sure we control these events. If a family needs food, we absolutely can help them, but we wanna make sure that, that we just don't run out of food at those sites, yeah. and um, so. Yeah, and then that, that leads to events. If somebody's in need, how can people get the food that they need? Yeah, so number one is just go to the website, safoodbank.org, hit the Get Help button, you'll pre-register. There's several sites listed on the website. Next week, there'll be uh, two major distributions, um, uh, one at uh, Toyota Field and, and the other one uh, in partnership with the Northside School District. Um, 
We'll also have other programs or strategies that the families can, can benefit from. Now, if they don't get out and, and they're not mobile, if they're a senior or have a disability, you can also um, list that when you put in the, the, the um, need for help. And we'll have volunteers that can deliver a homebound food box. Uh, we've been partnering with uh, Via Trans. They've been delivering a lot of boxes. Um, so uh, we want to make sure that you, that you get food as quickly as we can get it to you. And if you go to the website, if you lack internet access, you can always call our, our hotline. That number is 210-431-8326. And we'll make sure that we uh, uh, get you some, some food. Great information on the website. We just put it up as you were talking there, and you can. There's a lot of different things you can click on to learn about things like SNAP and other programs that are out there. More than just where you can pick up food when you're in San Antonio. All right. After last week, a lot of donations poured in. What is the food bank supply like right now? I guess supply of food and money. Well, you know, I think most people don't fully understand the volume that the food bank collects and distributes on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis. And I think the, the onset of COVID-19, when we were feeding 60,000 people a week and then it went to 120,000 people a week, we would roughly bring in about 35 to 40 semi-truck loads of food each week. So about a semi-truck load an hour. Well, at the onset of the crisis, the sources where we'd normally get our food, like uh, grocery stores, they were selling out of food, which meant that there was less food that was being donated. We also rescue food from hotels, restaurants, caterers, a lot of food that's prepared to be eaten and not, we can pick up those leftovers. Well, those two segments of the, of the supply chain, that, that decrease actually dropped us to about 22 semi-truck loads wow. for the week which think, you know, 35 to 40, it almost cut our donations in half. When the demand that was being shipped out of the food bank was about 70 semi truckloads. So taking in 22, shipping 70, it really took our supplies at the warehouse down and we were really panicked that we would, we would run out of food. Um, and so that's where we just started to, to, to really reach out to the city, to the county, um, to the state and to the federal government to really educate them on what was happening. Uh, and then um, the community started to step up. And I tell you, uh, last week, you know, we were able to get to that 70 semi truckload level. We, we, we just we had a few extra trucks leave the warehouse, then came in, but we held our ground. That's great. Um, if you think about the total supply, it's about three weeks. If, if we were you know, struggling to bring it in and it was just going out, we'd empty the warehouse in about two and a half to three weeks. Um, and so we're just working as hard as we can to keep those supplies coming in so that we can continue to meet the need. Final question for you. I do to help. Well, I, first, let me just say thank you, San Antonio. Um, I, I, we're all exhausted, but um, San Antonio inspires me. Uh, I mentioned the volunteers, but we've got great companies, right? Um, and they're the usual suspects, you know, Valero, HEB, USAA, uh, Nationwide, at and I'll get in trouble because I won't mention all of them because every company in this, in this city has given to the San Antonio Food Bank. Um, and thank you. Uh, the foundations, the individuals, everybody's stepping up. Um, the four things we need is food, time, money, and voice. Um, food donations in the non-perishable sense. We have not asked the community to donate that yet, just because HEB, Walmart, others need opportunity to get caught up. And as soon as they get caught up with their inventory, we'll ask you to donate a non-perishable food item. But money and volunteers um, are huge. And then using your social media platform, um, many people have done, you know, collection drives. We have a virtual food drive, and so you don't even need to leave your house. You can you know, do a virtual food drive, get your friends involved, and you can help us big time at the food bank. I'd say the last thing, Steve, that families can do while they're at home is make sure you watch for your census. Um, that's a big way in bringing in those federal resources to our city. 
So, so go to my2020census.gov, uh, watch for that envelope in the mail, be sure to fill that out because that'll mean resources for our city for this long-term recovery effort uh, at the conclusion of this crisis. Eric, thank you very much for all that you do and for your volunteers and your staff there. I mean, I know it's been a Herculean effort over the last few weeks. So thank you very much for what you do. Hey, thank you guys. And thank you for making time because I know you're on ABC World News tonight. And you know that the fact that you would still go on with us local people, that that means a lot. You know, my, you know, the head is shrinking. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, uh, you know, it was, it was just hitting the head. I was, yeah, I was I, swollen. I, I'm just giving you a grief. We'll be yeah, right yeah. back.